Hey everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, we have uh, for you for this session we have uh, David Duncan and Neil Gampa uh, going over uh, deep learning image based on Fedora Cloud Edition, um, empowering AI development and training. Uh, so I will turn it over to them. Hi everybody, we're so glad to see you here. Yeah, I'm David, um, and uh, and I'm Neil. And Neil and I work together on a lot of things. Um, there's probably a fair number of people in here, though, who collaborate with Neil on a regular basis. So I'm not claiming any sort of any any, <laughs> any exclusivity. Uh, special, yeah, exclusivity or, or special uh, special conditions. Um, I'm I'll I'll just say it. I'm I'm a solutions architect for Amazon. So uh, surprise, um, deep learning and is not a uh, a, a skill that is that is um, foreign to me. It is uh, just one of the things in the toolkit that I think we should be working on. But uh, my heart is in open source, and so I spend a lot of time working on Fedora and on, and on uh, open, open source uh, uh, software and operating systems. And uh, this is a subject that's dear to my heart. Yeah. And as for me, you know, I've been doing Linux and open source stuff for oh, uh, most of my life now. Uh, and uh, I do lots of things in Fedora. You can see the list. I do lots of things in CentOS. I also do things in OpenSUSE and, uh, and, and Magia and OpenMendream and whatever. I have a podcast and uh, recently struck out a, as with my own uh, uh, consulting firm to kind of help other people do the whole open source thing. Because, like, one of the things I've observed over the years is that, like, Yes, there's lots of cool open source things. There's lots of great stuff out there. There's a, lots of great communities. But sometimes people don't know how to get there. And that's, that's like, also why we do, David and I do stuff like this. Is exactly we, this talk. <laughs> we want to get people a, a pathway into doing cool things. And, like, when David brought up this idea of this, you know, neural AI stuff to be able to do with the cloud and desktop with open source stuff, I was super excited about doing this with him. And so here we are. So, um, what the heck are we doing up here talking about uh, machine learning and, and, uh, and um, deep learning and machi machine images? We, we're the people who build the images, right? So, a lot of times we look out into the world and we see the, the things that uh, data scientists and data engineers have to go through on a regular basis to get to a position where they can actually do what they need to do. Are they able to use accelerated instances? Are they, are, or, or um, uh, NVIDIA GPUs on their, even on their local systems, right? Like, is this a magical mystery? Did they, you know, did something come up that, that, uh, that their employer made them do? We want to be able to uh, ensure that, you know, you have a community uh, that, is listening to the questions you're asking, right? So for us, it's, you know. It's all about the dancing hot dog. Yeah, it's all about, the, it's all about the beefy miracle. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, the question we have, you know, the questions we hear, the questions we hear people want answered is, how do I RPM install that? You know, <laughs> or, or uh, how do I remove it after I've done after I've done whatever it is that I need to do? Or how do I reproduce what I'm doing? How do I scale it out? Provide a script for someone else to do exactly the thing that we've that it, we've done. And other aspects of this stuff that's been coming up more recently has been, well, how do I understand what I have to make this work um, on multiple machines? How do I do this on my computer? And how do I then take that thing I'm done on my computer and put it into a larger, uh, larger scale environment, and this is like a big part of what this is about: is showing off the ways to put those pieces together in a way that you can easily do it yourself and for a single thing, and then take it up to a larger, a larger environment. Yeah, and so I've, without costing an arm and a leg. <laughs> and, and we've also we've also determined that there are lots of people that we've we've asked about this uh, in in uh, positions where they were doing you know trying to do this for other people, 
And the response I've gotten back is like, well, we just dump it right here in a big glob in the middle, and that that glob is what uh, what we use. The sacred glob. The sacred glob. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you know, sometimes they follow a, a Linux file system hierarchy. Sometimes they don't. You know, That's, no. typically not. Yeah. But and so we see a lot of these problem these these uh, uh, tools moving into a place where almost immediately. It's difficult to uh, identify CVEs. It's, identif it's difficult to have uh, common communication around which ones are the best. Uh, and it's definitely impossible to have a long-term support model for uh, reproducibility or, um, or, or maintenance. Or maintenance. Like one of the larger challenges that we've kind of uncovered through this, I think sort of by accident, uh, is no one actually knows how to keep up with it or keep up, keep it working. And, and that is actually size. It shouldn't be. It should be shocking, but both of our backgrounds make it a little less shocking to us. Yeah. But it's, it's not good. <laughs> well, spending a lot of time with people who, who, are, who are willing to just put stuff out there and then to destroy it, like in, in my world, in my daily world, <laughs> um, uh, it's, it comes as no shock that there's, a, there's kind of an ephemeral approach to things. But, of course, in science, an ephemeral approach doesn't get you published. So, so from the perspective of, of uh, finding a way to do this work um, in a way that is reproducible for others, it is better to have a way to do that um, that, is, um, that is structured. In our NeuroFedora group, um, our NeuroFedora neuro group wants to publish, and they want to be able to be recognized, and they want to, uh, they want to find a way to create blog posts, to create reproducibility. And the way they do that is by developing a spin and uh, providing a, a, a context for other people who are doing brain scan, specifically brain scan uh, work, um, but then hope that their tools work for somebody else, right? So you have this very task-specific model. And we started there. NeuroFedora was a quick and easy way for us to identify um, a, a workload, a workload and, and, a, uh, uh, and, and uh, a, a description. But the community is much bigger, right? So we see this from, we, we see that there's a giant an analytics community out here um, that is building against different kinds of hardware, different kinds of, of uh, uh, or building for different workloads. Uh, they're using lots of different types of hardware. Um, the, you know, Intel has their, their uh, Gaudi series. Um, the, you know, NVIDIA today is the H100, used to be the G series. Right now we're, we're just moving, moving, moving. And, everybody and then AMD's got the Instinct. Uh, uh, well... More, more importantly, AMD has the instinct, which is which is giving us, uh, which gives us a foundation for a lot of the work that we do. Um, there's a gentleman in in Fedora, uh, Tim Flink, and Tim uh, came up with our the structure around our uh, PyTorch um, uh, stack. Stack, yeah. Um, but uh, but we're on the cloud team, and. When we look at what we're doing, we look at where the images go. Like, what what are you building against? We're you know we build cloud bases for basically every every um, every public cloud mm -hmm. that we can, and, then, and some private clouds, and some private clouds, um, a generic instance that can be used on OpenStack plus plus, um, and we do vagrant builds so that we can so that we can make sure that all of this is uh, is um, accessible, accessible from a developer. So. This led us to somewhere that we think uh, you, as someone who is responsible for analytics, should kind of start to start to turn your attention, right? And the reason we think you should turn your attention that way is because the uh, the structure of the reproducibility and the ability to have images that suit your requirements, but also have some generic overlays, is a really important part of that. Um, whether your workload is a container or it runs in a, in a, machine. In a machine, yeah, it, it doesn't matter to us. We want to be able to make sure that those images are something that's, that is easily creatable and easily composable, which is why last year we 
we came up with this idea of putting it together um, in uh, this tool called Kiwi. So, Neil, what is Kiwi? So, Kiwi is an appliance. Uh, Kiwi is a tool that builds operating system images for a, uh, for any Linux-ish platform. Uh, it was originally from the folks at SUSE. It is an OpenSUSE project, and it is now used by not just OpenSUSE, but Fedora as well as CentOS. Uh, one of their SIGs, the, uh, two of their SIGs actually, the CentOS Hyperscale SIG and the CentOS Alternative Images SIG, they both actually build um, various images, cloud images, live installed desktop images, um, uh, uh, container images, that sort of thing using the Kiwi Image Build tool. And of course, uh, as we said, Fedora also uses this now for building the cloud-based images, the Vagrant images, and the container images. Um, but another one is that a downstream of Fedora, the Fedora Sahi Remix, is actually uses Kiwi as well to build all the images that we use to make available for people to run Fedora Linux on Apple Silicon hardware. Um, and of course, OpenSUSE, which is where all this started, they use it for building all their images from containers to cloud images to ISOs to disk images that you can use to put onto laptops and desktops and stuff like that. Um, and so this has become a very flexible and powerful tool that can be used across different Linux distributions as long as you use a supported package manager and the certain tools that it expects. Like if you use DNF or apt, um, or Pac-Man, if you're so inclined with Arch, um, and you're using Draken as your init RamFS generator, then you can actually make any image you want that it supports with it, and and kind of have at it. We're using it obviously with DNF and and building Fedora images, and uh, and uh, I I know that in a past life I made Ubuntu images with it, uh, and I used to actually like maintain um, live images and cloud images. Um, based on Ubuntu using this tooling. So it is, it is a very powerful and flexible tool and it has a lively community with people that are very responsive and actively engaging to, the com to community needs, which was very important to us because we'd been burned over the years with a lot of different, uh, with a graveyard of tools where people uh, you know, had made some kind of image building tool because they thought, oh, making an image is easy. I'll just you know, throw on some packages and then write a script or two and then throw it inside of a file and turn it into a disk image and call it done. And then it turns out putting together a computer is hard. Um, putting together the software for the computer is very hard. And putting it together task specifically. And putting it together in a way that you could customize it for specific tasks is absurdly hard. And so uh, people tend to give up, and then the, then the graveyard gets bigger. Um, this one has actually been around for like a decade, and it's, been, it's even been re, uh, revised and renewed in a way to be more distro agnostic, and it's been, it's been a good success for us over the past six months as we've rolled it out within Fedora yeah. and over the past couple of years in CentOS and other places. Yeah. So, so uh, we wanted to use a tool that allowed us to... Uh, create an environment through uh, sort of a simple task management model. And when we look at the way that um, machine learning is, is packaged, that becomes not so easy to, to, uh, uh, to do because a lot of tools that, uh, that uh, you know, we specifically want to work with are not packaged or are moving so fast that it makes it very difficult to package them. Or they contain uh, proprietary components that are uh, necessary for a specific environment, right? So, um, the I mentioned NVIDIA before. Uh, those NVIDIA controller drivers are something that you, as someone who's responsible for uh, your own analytics workload, would I'll, would put into uh, an image. But us as, as uh, members of the community have packaging guidelines that require us to have everything uh, be appropriately open source uh, um, initiative approved and we have to have very specific licensing require for the, in order to include the software in the distribution. So what we wanted to do was to find a way that we could produce everything up to the point that it was a requirement to do uh, to do something that was off off limits for us as as free and open software. 
So enter the way that we build an image, right? With using the, uh, the components that are available to us um, on, um, from Kiwi, uh, we start with uh, a simple Kiwi description. And Neil made a lot of simple Kiwi descriptions. Um, yes. <laughs> so uh, there are a number of um, very, uh, projects, of sample projects that I've made. And in the Upstream Kiwi project, there is a, um, if you go to their GitHub, which is github.com slash OS inside slash Kiwi, or we'll take off the Kiwi part, there's a repo called Kiwi Descriptions, and that's a pile of samples of simple, uh, simple examples of how to use Kiwi to build an operating system image for a variety of Linux distributions. There's Fedora ones, there's CentOS ones, there's Debian ones, there's Ubuntu ones, there's Arch ones. So you can see how to use it for these different distributions in different structures and formats or however you like. Um, I personally, because I wrote it and spent a lot of time designing it, the descriptions that we use for Fedora, I really like the way that they are done because we have them set up with these fragments that you can then just pull into your own descriptions and be able to reuse the parts that you don't need to, to write and then you can write your own pieces on top and then combine them together. So it can get you very quickly through the process of making a new image and cut, making your own customizations on top. Yeah. And so this, this, uh, this methodology uh, allows us to create these composites. And the composite build, build practice is what we use to ensure that we have uh, a leaf model. So let's say uh, you're, working with, um, uh, you're working with a specific a specific version of PyTorch. Right? Sure, so, right. Like, yeah, you may you may find yourself in a position where you're saying, oh, "Okay, well, uh, you know, Fedora has this specific PyTorch that goes with this specific tool chain, right? Rockham or whatever." Yeah. The, then I want to have uh, I want to have one that is using pip to install PyTorch in, with the CUDA yeah, stuff. With the CUDA stuff. So then I can layer. From a base, a cloud-based image, I can layer on a composite configuration that has exactly that com that component list in it. Mm -hmm. And then once we've, so why we one, another reason we love to use Kiwi is that once you get that, you also get a manifest. So you're getting effectively a manifest of all the packages that are installed on so on this instance, plus all the scripts that ran and all the component parts that help you track exactly what it is that you're you're building against, and then you can use that to associate with CVE data or uh, or oval data or any of these the, these components that can help you identify whether or not you're running you're still running a secure environment. And if you're particularly masochistic, you also get a file that includes all the change logs from every package that's installed on there, so you can look through everything and all the data. But Including all these files, the interesting thing that's kind of useful, and it's not super obvious that you could do this, but if you have two image builds from the same descriptions at two different points in time, you can diff the resulting output files and see what changed. And because they're sorted always in the same way, you will be able to get a very nice understanding of like, oh, well, this package changed, these change log entries were added here, so this obviously, like, and if a behavior changes and you're like, I don't understand what happened, if you've captured all the output artifacts and you diff the two between one that worked and one that didn't, it is super easy for you to go narrow down to what caused the problem and go work your way backwards to fix it. Yeah. So we're constantly hearing about this because people think that cloud infrastructure for machine learning is super important. and. We believe that too. That's why we're here. That's right. But we also believe that I should be that we should be able to build those same images the same way on our own desktops. If I want to build it on my laptop and I want to do my my modifications and and uh, and experience it, I think that that's uh, that is a valuable experience, right? So for me, if if that if that image is something that is just baked and out there and I can't make any modifications to it, even though and, and it has a life cycle, it's going to disappear at some point, uh, all the component parts that I'm going to, are going to disappear, right? Then that means my reproducibility is blown, right? And what I want to make sure is that when, when it comes time for someone else to reproduce my results, they get the same results 
they have the same software, they have the same, same components. That means having a way to build that. And on the flip side of this, like my primary concern is, you know, again, I'm here from, from the Fedora desktops type of thing. One of the larger challenges we've also had, kind of complements what we're talking about here, is people are struggling to get these things configured and working on their computers. And if we can provide them the materials to be able to have, like, hey, we can make a desktop disk image that you can just DD onto your drive, and then you're just done, and everything's ready to go. And the first boot, it resizes and fills up the disk, configures the, the volumes and such. Like, this is basically the stuff we did for the Fedora Sahi remix. Like, we make a disk image, it gets DD'd to, the, to, a part, to a partition volume, and then on first boot, it detects the rest of the size, scales it up, and, like, configures everything. Why not do that for even just regular PC stuff? Like, you know, you're, you're, you're rolling out, like, maybe, you know, five or six, you know, you got a team of five or six people who are like, oh, we need to do stuff with, you know, we've got this Radeon AMD GPU that has, like, AI magic with Rockham and you want to have this all working and be able to do development on machine learning tasks, then you can make this image that you could then take a variant of that that you built for being able to roll out into the cloud for maybe a production workload or into a private cloud or on a server, on an optimized server. You can also then layer on top of that, you know, for example, the KDE Plasma desktop environment and roll it out onto workstations so that people can have the same tooling and the same baseline for being able to develop as well as to deploy. Yeah, so if you have a highly scalable workload, you can run it on the cheaper hardware to build, and you can run it on the more expensive hardware when you're mm -hmm. using your entire data set. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and hopefully you're doing it in a way that it doesn't you know, eat you alive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, so that's... I, he's fine with it. I would like you not to be eaten alive by your workload. I don't, I don't want it either. But, so we're supporting, today we're supporting uh, overlays with PyTorch uh, um, 2.8. We're running with our studio desktop. We've got the Rockham uh, configuration put together in a way that's super, super comfortable for us. But we're exploring some other things. Um, one of the things that we run into, like I said, we run into is, is the support for NVIDIA, NVIDIA controllers. Um, the idea that we've been toying with and we've gotten some, some interest, some bites on, has been to, uh, to, to transition the support for NVIDIA controller drivers into a CloudInit script. So to use a module in the CloudInit to, in fact, discover... Uh, what hardware is available on whatever cloud it is that you're working with, mm -hmm. and then to make that somewhere that we're we're uh, actually going back and installing the right driver from the right place. Um, so leveraging, if you're not familiar with CloudInit, CloudInit is a, a library that is, um, it's an open source library. It's GPL3, right? Yeah, yeah. It's so it's GPL3, and, and it's, uh, it's, um, it's built for um, initiating uh, specific actions at the beginning of a of a um, of an instance of boot. an instance boot. Yeah, it runs on on K, standard KVM, all the way up through or libvirt. I guess it's libvirt. Yeah, it'll work on libvirt. It'll work libvirt. on Zen. Yeah. So if you're if you're if you're familiar with XCP NG, or if you're using Proxmox, or if you're using Overt or Rev, or OpenStack. Mm -hmm. Or Amazon, yeah. or, Azure, or Azure, or, or Google, Google yeah. or whatever, or even the VPS providers. Like a lot of the VPS providers, Cloud. like Fedora Cloud Editions, used on many VPS providers. That all, like this, is the common framework to configure at initialization time. And yeah. this lets us. What we're thinking of is providing a way to just discover that we're on NVIDIA hardware that seems to be headlessly capable of doing stuff. And we wire it up and set it go. Yeah, there's usually instance metadata of some sort from whichever from the public clouds that allows us to to get that information or demessage yeah. identifiers that are that are distinct uh, enough that we can make um, immediate decisions about about which one of the the um, the work or Models. which which one of the accelerated uh, cards is supported. And uh, then building common overlays is another thing we want to do here is, is it's obvious that these files are going into very specific locations. There are specific kernel modules that we're using, so it's easy enough for us to identify that we can have a K-mod. That K-mod looks like this. We can insert that K-mod at the, at, at the at post 
our post build. So we can do a standard build and then we can use the ability of Kiwi to do an overlay. And the overlay can have the files that we want to, to drop down into that uh, configuration. So right now. You guys got a question? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's fine. The, uh, what is this getting you over a Docker or a Podman build, build image? <clears throat> if you're getting to that later, it uh, seems it's solving a similar problem. So the, the, the core difference between this and, say, a Docker file, because I assume that's what you're talking about, it's like a Docker file style build, is that the Docker file style build is imperative and stepwise, whereas this is done in such a way where it is hybrid declarative and imperative, you don't actually have to use any of these imperative things. Everything could be fully declarative and in such a manner that um, you're able to see, uh, you're able to actually see the steps, the, the, the way it gets to that point to resolve the state that you're asking for. Um, and this actually also is intended to be portable across whatever kind of baselines that you want to apply this overlay to. So a Docker file by design is essentially a, a solid layer on top of something that you've already put it on top of. So you do from Fedora 40 and then you put things on top. So with these overlay snippets and concepts that we're using, um, we can say, okay, this is the conceptual, the, these are the things that we expect you to have in here. And if we're not expecting anything distro specific in these, in these declarations, then we don't actually have to define any distro specific stuff. Yeah. And if you have a multi-distro definition, so for example, I, I, long ago I built a Kiwi description that did Fedora, CentOS hyperscale, Ubuntu, uh, LTS, and, uh, and OpenSUSE Leap, all in one definition, all four of them. And I was able to have many of the overlay snippets and configuration modules be able to work on all of them without having to have any specific deviations for the different distributions. And so that's the kind of thing you're able to do a lot more easily because you each individual configuration overlay is self-contained in such ways that as long as you write it correctly, you can port it to anything you would like to use. So it makes fungibility upgradability, switching costs lower. It makes things, it could optimize for different particular needs. Like for example, if you want to use Red Hat Enterprise Linux because you want to have a support, you want to have maintenance and support contract with uh, a vendor that can provide those kinds of things for you, then you can just plug in the, in, you can plug in a module that says, hey, I want to build this against Red Hat Enterprise Linux. All the other pieces all be, get reused. The image gets recomposed with Red Hat Enterprise Linux as an output. And then you can use that. Or say, I want to use SUSE Linux Enterprise Server or SUSE Alp, then you can plug those things in and then it does that. That's the sort of thing that becomes really handy. From, from the data science perspective, you might find it, you might find it sort of simplified, right? Like, oh, okay, well, I can just do this in Podman and then I get this image and then I run it on the Kubernetes cluster that I've got, right? But as a data engineer, you might find yourself in the, from the perspective of, I'm now working for a new company, and this new company expects me to be able to run this workload on this operating system under these conditions. And then you would have the ability to sort of translate that knowledge back into what you're doing with, the, uh, uh, with this new base environment without doing, with, as Neil points out, without doing much in the way of, mm. of modifying your, your fundamental workload. Yeah, so that's effectively where we're going. Um, uh, so um, we are working here. Yes, this is a GitHub <laughs> repo. It is a thing on the internet. That's it right. even is from the internet hamster. That's right. <laughs> and eventually, we will we will push these uh, once they're in in uh, a strong a strong set, and we've gotten good feedback. We'll push those into the Fedora Kiwi definitions for consistency. There may be some things that you know will be shared uh, in documentation, additional additional conversations that are specific to to different types of hardware, right? Um, I'll give you an example from my own world, right? Like how you put the inferentia 
uh, instances to work on on Amazon EC2 is not yet upstream. Um, and it is also very special. It's it's necessary. To, it's different, and it requires very specific versions of PyTorch to to have integration with the Neuron SDK. So, in practical, you know, in a practical way, all those decisions have to be made, and they have to be made in a very specific way. That also includes transition, like requirements for networking and other things that are not uh, not just dirt simple, right? They require they require configuration changes and support. There's a guy over there who knows all about that. <laughs> right, over there at the end. <laughs> so that's really our future, you know, our future requirements um, uh, are that we want to have machine images for all the environments that, uh, that you could possibly run in. Um, these are just a few. And then we also want to do a workshop. So I'm really looking forward to getting some feedback from anyone in the, in the room or, or anywhere in the world, really, uh, who is interested in helping us to develop better workshops, better, uh, better uh, functionality in the images, and looking at very specific workloads with you to make sure that we can help you get to the next level of being able to build your own images and, uh, and make your own decisions around the hardware and the control of your environment for machine learning and training for those big fat models that people keep talking about these, la these last few uh, few these months. last few months, oh God, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm sure if you want to do that, you can, yes. Yeah. So with that, uh, any questions, comments? Um, so you're talking about the deployment of, say, infrastructure to run something. Uh, do you guys, uh, what approach do you take when, when things do change or develop? Are you guys just creating new images and like a new, new, new definitions. Yeah. And the definitions themselves are the part that we want to make sure that everybody understands is that it doesn't matter that um, we know that environments are going to change, right? What we want to do is make sure that your life cycle is recorded and citable in the same way as any part of other part of your scientific research. But then beyond that, to move, like, we've already gotten to the point where we can cite the neural fedora. So we can cite, identif we can identify, I can't remember exactly which organization it is, but one of the citation, ex like, it's super easy to do in Zotero, if, you <laughs> if, you, if that excites you. So uh, we, can have the, we can have a Fedora 40 uh, citation for NeuroFedora. We want to be able to do citations for the specific uh, configurations down, down to the combination of, of, uh, um, of composite scripts that are that are built to use for this um, uh, from, from the perspective of the, the distribution. That way, even if the image does not exist any longer, you can still get back to exactly what it was that you were creating. And so if someone wants to doubt or you know, doubt you and, and reproduce your exact environment, then they have uh, almost, almost everything that they could possibly need, uh, or at least from the perspective of the, like, the bill of materials. And, right. and the build. And from the perspective of, you know, of wanting to have um, an easy way to be able to actually roll these things out and be able to understand what's happening, because a big part of the confusion that, I, that we've observed in this, in this space when talking to people and trying to figure out what, what people want is they don't actually know how it looks. They don't know how it works. They don't know how it's assembled. They don't know how it's maintained. Or they're heavily opinionated. Like the heavily or opinionated, yeah, and their usually, are wrong. is usually the part. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> they're very specific, and they make it very difficult for anyone to have a relationship with current current fig configurations versus versus configurations in the future. And one of the things that I, um, one of a, a rhetoric that I hear fairly consistently is everyone wants a rolling release. Well, I can tell you 100% that as no. a biologist. I did not want a rolling release, right? I wanted everything to stay exactly the same so that if somebody else came back to it, they got the same error I did. <laughs> yeah, because so, then that means you're not crazy. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it does mean, and, and it's 
and it's proof. Yeah, I can prove it. You can yeah. prove it. <laughs> and, but, or at least you can prove yeah. you're crazy in the specific way that's important. But also as a data engineer, I mean, as someone who's now responsible for very stable systems, right, my goal is is to ensure that regardless of where I go, regardless, and, and I don't know about you, but I think about, in my world, I think I have a career, I don't have a job, right? Like my job is temporary, my career is life Is forever. Firm. Yeah. So, so my goal is that wherever I go, I'm going to be able to hit the ground running with a series of tools that make it possible for me to do this, and I can focus on the math, and I can and not focus on on, uh, on, on whether hell. or not I can run it. Yeah. yeah, a big part of it is people want to actually just do the thing, and it turns out getting to do the thing is utter hell, and we would like to make it not that. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like most of this is stra strapping together in new images. Do you have any contingency for, say, patching up a pre-existing system to accommodate for new tasks? Um, so that would typically be a different... So this is largely about composition of new images. You're right. Um, a way to... There was actually an alternate version of this pattern, which is done using Ansible, which you can use to, to yeah, take true. up a baseline to a particular thing. So there are two composite strategies here. I didn't think you did, but we almost put it in here. I think we forgot to. I, I guess I did. Yeah. Okay. But it's also in the Internet Hamster. So, yeah. like, if you want to look. We have a, yeah, we have a we have a uh, specifically a virtual desktop version uh, where where we've done this with Ansible. So we we create the Ansible configuration, build all of the component parts, and then push that to uh, to an in, to an image that is already pre, running. Already running. Yeah. Right. So. If you want to like boost up an existing deployment into this, then that, that is the approach we'd probably go with. But a big part of what David's world is, is people just hitting the nuke button and then making new ones again um, all the time. Yeah. And so um, the thing about the patching up to this versus provisioning new ones is that patching up to this is a very expensive operation. It can take two to three times as much time uh, because you're because you're actually upgrading or changing things in a running system but then you also have to multiply that by the number of instances that you have to change it with and it becomes like drastically it. Yeah. high but if you compose it once and then just provision it you 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 cut the time down to like you know instead of it being like three or four hours it's probably like 10 15 minutes yeah I like to I like to fall back on the statement of fail-only architecture. <laughs> I like to say that you, you yeah. always want to have a system that you can reprovision at a moment's notice <coughs> because that moment may be when you least expect it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, a little bit of it, kind of gone over a little bit in my head, but I have some way to clarify things. So put myself in the biologist or the, the informatics uh, so if I if I wanted to sort of to recreate the, the protein blast environment and, yeah. and let's say that now they're using like NVIDIA GPUs over there because the protein folding is quicker. It's better. It's yeah. Better. yeah. It's, better. <laughs> okay. it's everything. But, but then I go and deploy this and there's no NVIDIA there. It's like AMDs, GPUs. Oof. <laughs> That's a big oof. Well, okay. So so you might have a t like you might have a tool set that that you might have a tool set that is specific to CUDA, right? And that would be a complication right there. So if your if your toolkit is at very very specifically using that instruction set, you might have to look up and say to yourself, "Well, these are not going to work." Yeah. <laughs> right. But but uh, but if you have you know if you have a, a a workload and you have the math and you have the ability to transpose that to Rockham, <coughs> Rock, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, then then you're you're uh, totally capable. Yeah, open open right. So I would also yeah. say to kind of add on to this, if you started building, if if you keep in mind that you That's might easy. wind up being on different GPUs for this. If your target platform for writing your math app is OpenCL, the open compute language, then you can take that, you know, whether you're starting on NVIDIA and going to AMD or the other way around, you'll be able to leverage that same coding and same, same process 
on the different things transparently. It's really only when you start getting into using CUDA or Rockham's direct APIs that, uh, and direct language map things that you get into this problem. If you go a level up and you use a common language and abstraction like OpenCL um, or um, uh, Vulkan Compute or SpareV, I, I forget, there's a few, few of these out there, or Sickle, that's it. Um, if you use those, then you can avoid that particular problem and you get this more um, useful reproducibility that can be applied regardless of the baseline hardware. Good, good luck on that. Though. Good luck on that, but also <laughs> if, you manage, if you do it, then you also get the advantage of being able to you know, get a good price on your hardware because that's usually how you get screwed is you, know, you only have one choice because of the way you wrote it and so therefore you're stuck. If you write it in such a way that you're not stuck, then you're almost always going to get a better deal out of how you're going to use these workloads in the long term. I agree. Yeah. Thanks for being here.